Hi, and good evening and a very warm welcome to another edition of Speaker's Corner with myself, Anne Dawson. If you are a regular viewer, um, well, to Revelation TV, you're certainly going to recognise our guest plural this evening. If, however, you've only recently started watching, but you did happen to watch four weeks ago, you would have heard an awesome testimony, but more than that, a very, very special message in a particular week that was dedicated to mental health, in particular, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and the absolute response that we got to that program was unprecedented here at Revelation TV. You, uh, to say you loved it is probably the wrong expression, but you were touched by it, you were moved by it, you were concerned by it, and Mark and Vicky, your lovely wife, were here again. We never really envisaged that there would be a part two, Mark. Initially, when you were coming on the program, it was never for two programs. It was only ever for one. Oh, no. Can I ask what's been your reaction to the response that it got? Well, and overwhelming, really. Um, Leslie and you, you, your kind self, let me know by via the email of the response, and Jackie at the office just let me know of the response. The phones were off the hook, and mm. uh, you know what it is, Anne. I think because it's it brings inverted commas shame and disgrace, and it's a hidden thing. You know, it's uh, it's something that we all try and hide. And I'm, I've become the world's best actor um, when someone actually comes out and says, "This is how I walk my daily life." People think, "Hang on a minute, I can relate to that," and suddenly it gives them courage and boldness to carry on the walk. So, what a privilege! I'm here tonight with Vicky, and and, uh, and that's the whole point because you know we we bring testimony time here. Uh, at Revelation TV, but this is on Speaker's Corner. And the reason being, you've got a message to bring out there to people. And, and part of that is not to, not to just assume that OCD is all about maybe washing your hands a few times more than you should, or double checking the doors are locked at night or when you leave the house, that it is so, so much more. It's not a one size fits all. It's very, very severe in 50% of cases, and you would fall into that 50%. Vicky, I want to welcome you on the program uh, tonight too, because when the programme finished the last time, before we even had any idea of the, of the response that this would generate from our viewers, I drove home knowing that you, just feeling absolutely convinced that you had to come on and we had to do a part two. How did you feel about being asked to come on to bring a perspective from somebody who's not suffering, but someone, well, you are suffering, but somebody who's living alongside a sufferer of OCD? How did you feel when you were asked to do that? Um, the strange thing is, the Lord laid it heavily on my heart that I would be joining Mark tonight. I just knew. So when Leslie asked, um, I didn't hesitate to say, no, that's absolutely fine. I will come on and share from a wife's point of view and on behalf of our children. So, and, yeah. and you watched the programme the last time. Yes. How, what was that like watching your husband talk about something that's been such a major, major part of your life? Um, before, I mean, Mark's been with Revelation TV for 13 odd years. So I've seen him over the years um, bring up OCD. He's never gone into any great detail, no great length. Um, to have a whole program on it, he was quite concerned how it would affect me. But I tuned in and I was captivated. I was really proud of him, really proud. Mm. And um, lots of thoughts were going through my head. Um, but it was raw, but that is how Mark is. He actually doesn't have shame. He's happy to share what this illness is, if you want to call it an illness. Yeah. Mark might disagree there. Um, so, no, I was very proud. Well, you know, I'm well aware that you could be potentially watching this evening thinking, oh no, I missed that, that the, the programme that they're actually talking about. Whilst we can't recap the whole thing, we really would love to um, give you a flavour. And just before we do that, because we're going to, uh, we're going to show Part of the programme that you did with regards to what was a typical day. But before we do that, backing up slightly, just uh, you know, in a in brief summary as to what this condition is and how long you've been suffering from it, um, could you just summarise, Mark, for anybody out there who wasn't fortunate enough to see the first programme, what is this and how has this affected your life? And my father left us when I was 16, quite 
by surprise and I remember at the time my brain going up a few levels of speed and, and, and working and whirring and uh, I found myself just obsessively checking plugs, taps and doors just to get a sense of security. The father figure in my life has walked out by surprise, gone, bang, there you are, you're now the, the, the man of the house. Oh, 16 years old, I think not. So I suddenly started having these ideas of trying to keep the family together, etc., and keep everything safe, okay? Got no chance of doing it, but I've entered onto that pathway now. And over the years, this morphed. It's gone light years beyond checking doors, pl plugs and taps and gas ovens. It's, it's, it's gone light years beyond that. And I've spent the last 25 years trying to avoid uh, obsessively any situation where I would engender upon myself any sort of um, disgrace, shame or reproach. And there are various ways in which people can bring that upon themselves. And I suddenly found myself over the years just getting these rituals which were virtually all mental. Some of them were physical. You would sometimes notice what I might be doing some weird stuff. And um, yeah, just obsessively trying to avoid these things, uh, which the Bible says because Christ took them upon himself. You know, he bore the shame, he despised the shame. The Bible is full of verses about you will not be put to shame, disgrace, it's, it's full of it. But the enemy decided, and you, you spoke earlier on the earlier show about you believe the, the devil can see a physical anointing on some people. Mm -hmm. I never knew I'd be on Rev TV for 13 years, inspiring and encouraging people. Maybe the enemy did, and I think he went over time on my brain, and uh, I just suddenly started developing an unbelievably quick brain. I spent all these years feeling basically ill, uh, anxiety-ridden, sick, burdened, heavy, all the time putting a smile and a joke on my face and, and acting normal. You become a very good actor, you hide things to the nth degree. And uh, my brain suddenly become this playground, really, for the enemy to use. And, uh, and it affected my emotions and all of a sudden you live in this area, in this life where you are literally wading through treacle and when I say that my brain registers everything, that is no exaggeration. When I'm off the planet, when I'm really, really struggling, I'm even counting my heartbeats, the times that my eyes blink, whether my right hand's on top of my left, whether yours is this, that and the other. My brain registers everything. It is anxiety city to the nth degree. As I say, I'm the only person that ever got chucked out of an OCD self-help group by the leader because I was a bit too upsetting for the other guys. So, uh, Well, like we say, 50% um, of all sufferers, what would normally come under the banner um, of OCD, are classed as extreme. Uh, we are going to show you part of the first um, programme, which really... Um, inspired us to bring up part two because we wanted to hear more from Mark. We didn't get a chance to um, to really uh, finish some of the issues that we wanted to address, but more importantly, we actually wanted Vicky here as well to bring, uh, you know, just a different angle to really what it's like to live with a sufferer of uh, OCD. But let's have a little look at what a typical day is for Mark as he's suffering from what is often called the silent agony. Yeah, with this, and comes such a heightened awareness and a quickening of the mind. My brain is so shockingly quick, it registers everything. And I'm talking everything. When I'm really bad, I can even register my heartbeats and how many times I'm blinking per minute and whether your right arm is above your left arm or whether you... And I, I, I'm, it is such an utter awareness and it is utterly exhausting. So I wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is, um, uh, did I get done for drink driving? Uh, no, I didn't because I only had one bottle of lager last night, which is 250 milliliters. 284 milliliters is half a pint of lager. So you're thinking, right, you could probably get by on one and a half pints. So I had half a lager with a full dinner, which probably meant I went to bed clear. Fine. There, eight hours later, yeah, yeah, I'll be clear now. That's the first thing that you deal with. It's the very first thing in the morning. Where am I? Oh yeah, I'm in bed. Was, have I been in bed all night? I think I have, yes I have. Look at Vicky, yeah, she's still there. Um, yeah, nothing, no, I haven't been done. I haven't been done for drink driving. Okay, I can now get up. Okay, get up, away you go. Um, spend 15 minutes getting dressed because you can't just get dressed. You have to make sure that your clothes aren't too tight and you're not being strangled to death by your jumper. Okay, 15 minutes getting dressed. You get out the door, finally. Uh, you make sure you haven't murdered your children. Uh, yeah, they're still alive. Yeah, they've gone to university, gone to school. Yeah, are they definitely alive? Yes, they're definitely alive. Out you go to your cab. Uh, and when I say that you register everything, I do mean everything. And even down to the fact that I know whether I'm turning to the left, turning to the right, whether my feet are together. 
um, the strength with which I hold my cab key. Into the cab you get, make sure you're sitting correctly, it can take you 10 minutes to sit correctly because you need to be comfortable, make sure you're not um, asphyxiating yourself. Off the drive you go, drive out of the village, don't say hello to anyone just in case you molest them or kill them. Get to the garage, fill up with diesel, uh, spend 20 minutes there because just in case you drunk the diesel, in which case you'll be dead within 24 hours and all your fears would have come true anyway. Finally get onto the A2, avoiding all the speed cameras. Did you get done for speeding? No, definitely not. Register that 22 times in your head. Get onto the A2, through the Blackwall Tunnel up to Canary Wharf. Uh, have you any, run anyone over in the uh, roadworks in, in the Blackwall Tunnel? When I was bad, I'd go back and forward through the Blackwall Tunnel up to five times, take maybe, maybe two hours. Uh, to get finally to Canary Wharf, just in case you had run someone over in the Blackwall Tunnel. Uh, start your work, get in, uh, person gets in the cab, uh, make sure you don't, uh, make sure you haven't molested them. Okay, another 22 rituals in your head as you drive off. Uh, take them to where they're going. Are they still alive? Yeah, they're still alive. Count times that by 20 times per day. Uh, get to the CAF, go to the uh, CAF. Um, people see the guys in there. Um, make sure you haven't committed anything heinous with those guys, even though they're my fellow cab drivers. Uh, no, I haven't. No, I definitely haven't, which means I'm not, I won't be dead by the end of the day. Have your lunch, come out, go to the toilet. Uh, make sure there's no uh, people in there with which you could commit a heinous act and get a, a, a de deadly disease. Come out of there, get back in your cab, sit comfortably 15 minutes to get comfortable in case you asphyxiate yourself. Away you go, drive around, pick up people. Um, pick up people for 8, 10, 11 hours, sit in traffic, which will do your head in anyway. Um, go through loads of traffic light cameras, make sure you haven't got three points on each one, just in case you have, in which case you'll lose your license and then you'll lose everything. Uh, finally, head home, all the rituals carry on and on and on and on and on. Pull onto your driveway, make sure, I'm not joking, but make sure you run over your cat, because quite often the cat will just come in uh, as he hears the cab come down the road. Make sure you haven't killed him. Um, shut everything down, 15 minutes to get inside the door. Um, make sure the kids are still alive. Yeah, they're still here. Uh, make sure Vicky's all right. Uh, slowly start to wind down. I say wind down and relax. With someone like me, wind down and relax still means you're on 95% hyper, absolutely 95% hyper, but now you've made it. Your mission for the day is, this is a very abbreviated version, your mission for the day is almost done. You've nearly made it. You've nearly made it to the safety of sleep again. Um, spend five minutes trying to get yourself comfortable on the settee, mainly because if you sit to the right or to the left, you might asphyxiate your esophagus and your trachea, in which case you'll slowly uh, die while you're watching the telly. So make sure that you are comfortable sitting very straight. Um, yeah, every time you turn to the right or turn to the left to get yourself a cup of tea. Don't turn too far to the right in case you asphyxiate yourself uh, or your clothes might go across your esophagus too tight. Um, uh, look back, look at the telly, but make sure the telly's not too far to the left because if you look too far to the left, you'll asphyx asphyxiate yourself again. Oh, look, one of the kids is coming. Are they all right? Are they dead? No, they're not dead because I'm talking to them. Blah, 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 blah. Time to go to bed, uh, fun and games. Can you imagine that? You've done all that and then all of a sudden you've got five hours to get to bed. The fun and games never stopped. Gosh, and, you know, that was four weeks ago, Mark. It's still shocking when you actually listen to what you go through on a daily basis, but you've never heard that. You, no. you've, you've told people, but you've never actually watched yourself. How did you feel watching that in terms of listening to yourself and what you actually go through on a daily? It is surreal. Mm. It's almost mm. unbelievable. I could almost think if I was a viewer, he's exaggerating. And the irony is, no matter what words I use, that's only 5% of everything, yeah. Yeah. because we'd be all night just describing a typical yeah. day. It's painful in the extreme, and I've come to ex not accept, you've actually started changing my mind on that, I've come to realise actually this has become my normal life, and it's not normal, no. and it hurts. We spoke about it that actually the other hurts. day, didn't we? And this, mm. as you said before, this has got the nickname of the silent agony, and it is an agony. Many people can't mm. cope. Mm. Um, yeah, Vicky, how shocking. did you feel watching that? Because I know you watched it when it was live, when Mark was actually, you know, giving that account. But sitting here with Mark beside you and watching that again, what do you think when you're listening to that? I'm okay because mm -hmm. I'm used to it. I live with it. So I'm not shocked. Mm. I, I see it for real and it is real. And there's a lot more thrown in as well yeah. um, that he hasn't spoken about. Yeah. Um, so it does hurt. Mark speaks about how it hurts. It hurts mm -hmm. for me just every day, um, mm -hmm. not knowing how your husband's going to be. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll probably discuss it a bit later on, but how Mark has suffered so severely like that, 
but always overcomes, yeah. always overcomes. And I have the assurance and I know every day he'll always overcome. Mm. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant, you know, um, in terms of having that assurance, mm. but my goodness, what, what a difficult, what a, mm. what a hard walk, what a difficult road that you're traveling, mm. both of you that are traveling on. Um, it is Speaker's Corner, which means, of course, we're live, which means, of course, it's interactive. Uh, we'll be putting up details on the screen throughout as to how you can get involved. If you want to ask uh, Mark or Vicky, for that matter, a question, whether you're the sufferer or you know somebody is, or you're living with someone uh, who is, you know, please feel free to text, to email, um, keep them fairly short, um, you know, and also I would say, if you want to offer any encouragement um, to both of these lovely people, that would be great as well. So do feel free uh, to get in touch. But um, I'm going to come to you, Vicky, and I want to um, back up uh, slightly. And Mark has explained that it was, you know, 30 years ago that his dad left and when this first happened. But when did you first realise that Mark had OCD? I mean, did you even know what it was? How, what, how did it manifest itself? Well, we met at 19 years old and um, just instantly got on so well, we just clicked. Um, there was a slight hint of OCD, nothing much. I think I just remember the odd tap and door handle. Um, but not severe. Um, I don't remember that at all. Um, Mark was and still is a real fun person to be mm. with, very jokey, makes me laugh. Um, and we were um, just fun and free and enjoying life actually, um, with this slight hint of OCD. Um, it wasn't until um, we got married, we had an amazing wedding, um, we went on, started our family, and it's when we had our first child, Chloe. Um, and then it was about 16 months later, our second child, Jack, came along. And that is when it went wild. Um, it, it was um, out of control. Um, it affected um, me and my walk. Mark would be throwing the baby's milk away, thinking it was contaminated. So you'd make all your bottles up and then he'd throw them all away. Um, it, it progressed really quickly. Um, and I believe that's because the responsibility of being a father, providing for his family, it was very overwhelming for Mark. And this was all before you became Christians because you weren't, you weren't Christians at the very beginning or were you Christians at this point? Just remind us yeah, where we are. Yeah, I was um, brought up in the faith. So I, had th I did have that, but I wasn't born again. Um, it was when we had our children that we were introduced back into the church and um, we did an alpha course um, mm -hmm. while I was heavily pregnant with Jack and it just blew our minds. It was amazing. And uh, we were born again on, on, in the middle of this alpha course. It was just something else. Everything made sense. Everything became real. Um, at that time, we thought the OCD was bad then. Well, it took off even more. <laughs> Did you think at that time, were you thinking, oh, now that we know the truth and um, now that we've been introduced to the Lord, etc., that obviously God is the healer, so any whatever that was is going to go now that because we're Christians? Yeah, I feel quite embarrassed. Um, we touched spiritism and... Um, I, anyone out there, just don't touch it. It's just of the, of, 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 of the enemy. Not, not after, yeah. So obviously then when we um, came to Christ, found the Lord and um, our eyes had been fully opened, we saw the truth and uh, we repented of our past, of the getting involved in spiritism. And obviously we thought, this is it. Yes, this is it. Some prayer, some Bible study. Um, we can conquer this, but it, it wasn't that simple. And, you know, we spoke um, last week, um, Mark, how you'd been for prayer, you've tried all sorts, you, you know, you were sort of saying about, you know, got the t-shirt, etc. You tried absolutely every single thing to try and, and get rid of this. Um, 
any point when you either had prayer, was there ever any sign that it was, <clears throat> we'll come on to you had a bit of respite a little bit later, but was there any time when immediately either during or after prayer that you thought, oh, I think this is, I think this is going? No, not really. Um, mm. We had that little respite period, which we'll talk about later, but no, you could, it was like a blanket. It was like an oil filled blanket and heaviness that was on me every minute of every day. It never really lifted. It, you never really, would you say that was, if somebody was to say to you, um, I'm going to pray for you, Mark, because of your OCD, did you feel like, well, this is really a waste of time because Oh, loads. Of, oh, Anne. Yeah. Oh, absolutely loads. Yeah. And people are so lovely because mm -hmm. they, they come in with their ideas and, and, their, and their plans and their, their goodwill. And it's absolutely beautiful, Anne. But this has been so deep and so complex and so perplexing that finding anyone with even the remotest idea of how deep and painful this is has been like finding water in you know, the Gobi Desert. It's yeah. been impossible. And I've probably met two people on the face of this earth that have uh, one um, lovely guy walked the same sort of walk as me and even he admitted he said I'm just not in your league I really am not and he was bad I'm not in your league and uh, and our present pastor at this moment has a really good understanding of what you what I'm walking through so and you, that must help that definitely helps that because absolutely half of definitely it, helps it must be so horrific like I sit here I'm saying tell us about a typical day and you're but we're only scratching the surface. Yeah. And also, even if you were to exp to describe second by second, moment by moment, we're only hearing it second hand, we're not actually going through it. Yeah. So to have somebody that has at least a bit of experience as to what you're going through, that must help. A big boost, Dan, a big boost, because you have to remember with this, you actually feel ill all the time as well. So you feel bedraggled, you, you feel sick, you feel some, when it's really bad, you feel nauseous and, and almost bordering on dizzy. Mm. But life goes on, you know, um, I'm self-employed. No, I, I can't ring up, you know, Mr. Employer and say, I feel horrific today. Can I have a couple of weeks off? Everyone's going off with stress now, aren't they? Literally yeah, the whole yeah. world, yeah. Uh, everyone's cracking up. Mm. And I had no one to ring up. You know, I'm the only person who had a complete nervous breakdown and was back at work the next day. Yeah. I ended up face down in a pool of diesel in a garage literally with my mouth and my nose in a pool of diesel secretly hoping the lord would take me home i was on rev tv at the time presenting my own shows hoping lord take me home i cannot take this anymore quick visit to the doctors a few hours later got home cup of tea i was back in the cab the next day uh, you know it, it's absolutely incredible what the pain of you are going through what about your children though um Vicky, how, you know, what effect has, can I just say, uh, you know, we, we, you, in your words, you called it an affliction. Yes. And interestingly, before we, um, we go into how Mark's affliction has affected your children, when I looked at, I was thinking about the word affliction and I looked it up and I just wanted to read this out because it's synonymous with Disorder, disease, malady, complaint, ailment, illness, scourge, plague, trouble, menace, evil, wow. and visitation. Wow. wow. And I had to print this off and bring it in. Yeah. Because how do you feel when it's described as that? That's a dictionary. That is... <laughs> spot that, on. That is so spot Makes on sense. to the absolute mm. yacht and tittle. Mm. That is bang on. Isn't that... Yeah. yeah. We, mean, we, what, don't, we don't like to call it mental health. Um, we don't like to call it an illness, and, and um, you're, really we're all quite strong about that, aren't you? Affliction seems to fit. Well, I thought mm. I and, thought and it that just did. And it sums it up. Yeah. As I say, I printed mm. that off to bring yeah. in um, this evening because mm. I thought, yeah, that is actually describing that. precisely mm. what you go through. Mm. And the irony is, um, look, I, c I can barely change a, f a fuse and a plug. Okay, DIY, not my bag. Yeah. My strongest part of my whole makeup is ironically my, my brain, my mind. And so I, I call this an affliction because the enemy has chosen to afflict my strongest part. God in his providential wisdom has allowed it to happen for a protracted period of time, Anne, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and what he's done through this, 
he has took me down to nothing. I have no confidence in myself. I'm confident in my Lord, and yes. I am seated in the Lord, in the high places, far above all principalities and powers. Amen. Seated, job done. So I have no confidence in myself. I have no confidence in any of my abilities. So any time that you or a viewer see me on this television station, sitting here chatting away in the wee small hours about people's afflictions and, and trying to encourage people to get through, it, that is coming from a man who has no strength, no, no confidence in and of himself. Yeah. I am a vessel that has been completely, totally and utterly poured out to the point of dryness and I do believe the Lord has allowed it because if you're on Voice in the Wilderness at two o'clock in the morning and someone rings up and wants to take their life because of mental affliction, if I haven't been there, what right have I got, Anne, yeah. to actually say, hang on a minute, let's go to Isaiah 50 verse 10, to him who has no light, let him trust in the Lord God. Yeah. Okay, because if, if they are only just words to me, you can get a theologian to sit there and say that. Yes. Anyone, you can get Joe Absolutely. Bloggs that works in Kentucky Fried Chicken just to sit there and say, Oh yeah, where do I go now? Isaiah 50 verse 10. Uh, and if they're not happy with that, we'll go to Isaiah 41 in, in, in 10. In saying that though, you have lived off, uh, lived off scripture. They have kept you going. They've been life, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. literally. <laughs> what, and what's happened is, um, I said it in the first program, all semblance of reality, virtually all the time, is removed from me. So I, I literally have no idea of the reality of the situation that I'm in. So when I say I'm not sure if I've killed someone, yeah. um, I really ain't. Yeah. I'm really not, I'm hyperly panic struck yeah. all day, every day. And that's whether you're molesting people, killing people, raping people, this, that and the other. So because I've had no semblance of reality, it's all been taken away from me. I've been stripped yes. bare. Yeah. The only answer that I've got is to get into the Word of God. And I've lived in the Word of God for 21 years now, whatever it is, just to stay same, because if I'm not sure if I've killed the old grandma down Bayswater Road, uh -huh. if I'm not sure, and believe me, I used to drive up and down checking there were no dead bodies, yeah. believe me, I have to go somewhere where the person that wrote it claims to be the way, the truth, the reality, Amen. and the life. That's why I've lived in the Amen. Bible. And, and like you were saying, you know, for the work that you do here at Revelation TV and when you're doing Voice in the Wilderness, I, I heard somebody recently saying that, you know, it's not necessarily the Lord that is afflicting you. No. But nothing happens to us, I believe, that God hasn't ordained or allowed. Sometimes we don't know. Very often we don't know. But I heard someone say recently that very often the God, that God will allow us to suffer from something, from the very thing that he wants us to heal in others. And that... Amen. And that's what tonight is all about. That is what, is to, what tonight is all about because we're talking about what you've been through. But there's two words there, but God. Oh, always. It's like, this is happening, but God. And you, you, the both of you are here to bring reality and to bring um, the truth of what this affliction, is, this silent agony is really about. There'll be people watching just now that their hearts are somehow lifted slightly because not because you're going through this and not because you live through this but because they are and suddenly they're not alone so it's like you said about the guy earlier on you you are to them what that guy is to you yeah. suddenly they're in company and they don't feel so isolated it is not that silent isolated agony yeah. any longer. Um, just going back um, a second, what about your children though, Vicky? I mean, how have they coped? Because when we're talking about these rituals, they're fairly intense. How have the kids coped with that? Um, amazingly, um, our family life is quite normal, isn't it? Rather normal. <laughs> our children are thriving. Um, they're all totally normal. Um, we had um, a year of uh, prayer from a church we was in, um, from two elders. They came every week for a whole year. And Mark's prayer, probably every week, please Lord, may this not affect our children. Um, and you prayed also they would not get OCD and that they would um, be, be kept from it. And I can honestly say they have been. They're Isn't that amazing? wonderful, they're just, One's at university, one's um, a manager uh, for a firm. Um, our youngest is still at school, thriving. 
they know their dad has OCD. Um, <laughs> until this show, they didn't probably know quite how severe it was. So they're watching. But they're older now, they're yeah. older. Yeah. And I asked them, I spoke to them and I said, how has it affected your lives? And they pretty much said, it hasn't. They said there's times when dad makes us late. Um, it's really aggravating. Um, we can all be ready to go out and an hour later we're all sitting there still ready, waiting to go out. Um, but overall, he's um, an amazing dad. He goes running with two of our children. Um, lots of laughter. Um, we talk about our Christian faith in the home. It's quite normal, really. Yeah. So it we're, is. we're very blessed in, in that respect. And do you know what? And they, they don't mollycoddle me either. No. They don't wrap me up in cotton wool. Mm. And <laughs> if I'm really bad, Vicky will obviously make allowances and she, she yeah. knows. Actually, she, yeah, she, she, she can tell without even me saying a word, you know. But they treat me normal. <laughs> and uh, come on, Dad, hurry up, you know, just get on with it. What are you doing? Yeah. On a particularly bad day, and by that I mean Mark is having a particularly bad day, you know, how, how do you cope? How do you, how do you keep going? What do you do when you get up and say, oh, no, is it every day, Vicky? Is it every day or are some days fine and then... It's not because Mark's fine, but you're fine, and are there other days that you think, oh no, not one of those days? What does that look like? Well, firstly, we have come such a long way. It's been over 20 years, this walk, hasn't it? Yeah. And um, we have come such a long way, mainly because of our faith, our relationship with God, our walk with God. We've gone to such deep depths with God. Um, Romans 8, verse 28, all yeah. things work together for good for those that are called according to his purpose and you know, love the Lord. So it's not all bad, but there's been days where I have completely despaired. I cannot take it anymore. And then there's other days when it's not so bad. So um, one day this week, Mark was worse than normal. He woke up and um, his words to me were, um, I'm under one, um, I don't feel great. So I think I probably sighed. <laughs> Here that, we go. I, I mean, yeah. Your heart drops. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, it's like, right, what do I do? So for about five minutes, I actually don't say anything at all. Pretend it's not happening. And then all of a sudden, I think the Lord gets hold of me and says, come on. So I'll either go to my Bible or I might have a look on Facebook. And on Facebook, the amount of scriptures that have come off the page, and they always seem to be so relevant. Mm -hmm. They either Mark's already thought of it, or so it's like confirmation, or it's a verse that will just speak directly to his spirit. And, and do you read? Do you see? I those read it out loud. Do you read it to yeah, Mark? I read it out loud to Mark, and he's instantly encouraged. So it might help him, but not for the whole day, just for that time. And it'll be enough. He can get out of bed, get ready, get going. Um, if I have to go to work, then. Um, I'm waiting for his text. He'll always text me to say he's um, left the building, he's on his way to work, and then I can relax. If I'm at home, I'm sort of witnessing his struggles. Um, he'll eventually get out the door, and then he'll be standing by his taxi. Um, can't actually get in the taxi. Mm -hmm. And then I'm conscious of neighbours, other neighbours watching. Are they looking at him, thinking he's strange? Um, then I get in the car, go off wherever I'm going, work or shopping. And you, it does zap you of all energy, all energy, because it's been such a long, long walk. Um, but I do pray, and it can sometimes just be a few words, Lord, just help him, just help him. And then I sort of give, spiritually and emotionally, give Mark back to God. <laughs> um, I sort of say to my Lord, he's your child, he's a child of God. Please, can you come and help my husband? and then I can mentally move on. I've left him with the Lord. That's how I've coped. Yeah, I think that's really great how you've described that, Vicky, because it's like sometimes we just have to put our loved ones, and whether that's because they're suffering from OCD or any kind of mental anguish, or it's just they're teenagers and they're out late at night, or what, you know, and we worry and we're concerned, you know, we just have to hand our loved ones sometimes when we can't do anything over into the mm. care of the Lord, knowing that mm. he loves them more than we do. Mm. 
and although we love them very, very much, his love is a perfect love and yeah. we can trust him, but it's... And the Lord understands really a lot more than I do. You know, the Lord knows Mark inside out. So he's you know in good what, hands though, with the Lord. It's, <laughs> I'm looking at the pair of you. It's like he knew exactly what he was doing, putting the two of you together. We get on so well, of doubt. don't we? We do get on brilliantly. You know, despite this horrific affliction, and it is horrific and it has been horrific, we've had tears, we've had arguments, we've, we've had it all. But the Lord through it really has strengthened our marriage. And, and, and the one thing that the Lord would always remind me was my marriage vows in sickness and in health. You know, it can't, if, if the going isn't always good, you, you know, it's, you don't give up. You stick done. with it. And if you're in you Christ, done. you've got the Lord to strengthen you. Amen. And he really has. What about support from those around you, like the community, friends, family, um, perhaps doctors, the medical profession, or even the church? What, how, what level of support have you had over the years? Very, very little. Very little. Why do you think that is, Vicky? Is it they don't understand it or they don't want to get they involved? Don't, they don't understand it. You can't see it. We look fairly normal. Um, it, it's not like a, a broken leg. Um, I think it's too heavy for people. Um, th 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 there's been very little support. Um, our pastor now is wonderful and loves coming to chat with Mark and pray. He loves it if I join in as well. Um, other than that time I spoke about when the two elders from a, a previous church came for a whole year and then we did have a bit of a miracle. Let's just talk yeah. about that and then I need to, you're getting a load of texts and emails coming through. Thank you so much and we will be addressing those in just a second. But let's just talk about that, that period of time. How, how long, Mark, was that period of rest by? What, how much of a rest did you get and why do you know what happened there in order for you to have that rest? Do you know what, Anne, it was in response to, to prayer and I literally had, it was probably a two to three year but healing, Nearly really, three years. It was so how long ago was that? Ooh, Ten years. Yeah, a good, good decade ago. Mm. Yeah. And it was phenomenal. And suddenly I came to life. The blanket of everything was lifted off me. Uh, my brain slowed right down. I could rationalise everything. I could see reality. It was quite shocking. It was unbelievable. It was fantastic. And I started getting used to that and enjoying it. And then all of a sudden, I think it was in... It was Actually, I remember what it was. It was... I was... I was in down at uh, Pevensey Bay, going to walk into the post box to go and post my tax bill. How about that? That's how I remember it. And I remember walking to the post box with one of my kids thinking, hmm, feeling a bit heavy here, feeling a bit ritualistic. Tried to shake it off and it, it, it crept back, didn't it? it oh, back. did it come back? It back. Mm. Did it come back mm. gradually or was it like, oh my goodness, you went from not to 124 hours? No, gradually, um, over a, a few days. Um, but then when it came back, it it took right off again. Came out of a vengeance. Yeah, absolutely. I, re I remember it creeping back and um, I bet being so scared. must have been sinking. I just, just saying, no way, no way can it... We'd had almost three years and it, you know, completely gone. So it was a scary time. But the Lord equipped us the first part, you know, and, and he's done the same, you know, for the, for the following 10 years. So we, we've had to trust God in this because we relied on ourselves would be such a mess. I'm going to go to some texts and emails um, because there's loads coming through, some longer than others. I will just um, try and read some of the shorter ones out as we go. Um, Leslie writes in, praying for you, not our Leslie, uh, praying for you, Mark, uh, since I've seen the first part of the programme. Um, we've uh, got... Uh, We've got Mike who writes in, hi Mark and Vicky, maybe the suffering is so that in God's future kingdom, um, basically saying that you'll be a testimony as to what it was like to live under um, such oppression and that your time is going to come. Thanks, I Mark. think we need to hang on to that. Hi Mark, Amen. really um, sorry about what you're going through and sorry that not seeing you on Word and Prayer oh, um, with Matt and that's from that. Wayne and um, Wend. Um, we've got another one here. Mary writes in, I am so, so touched by Mark and Vicky. I often watch him on Revelation TV and he always impresses me. All I can say is God's blessing is surely on you, Mark. You're a wonderful human being. Wow. Please, please, God, give him a break, she's saying. Isn't that lovely? Wow. Um, yeah, thanks, Mary. And then another one, Jeff saying, hi, Anne, please tell Mark I miss him on a Tuesday night. I think oh. we'll get quite a few of those oh, no, coming Jeff is. through. Um, <laughs> 
Um, I, Mark, I understand you've tried everything to get rid of your OCD. Um, you've also said that you recognise the work of the enemy affecting your whole life. Um, he's asking if you ever had um, any deliverance, have been involved in the deliverance ministry, and yeah. I think you mentioned last yeah. week that you have, Mark. Absolutely. Yeah. When you say that prayer that you had that, or that, that, that got you that respite for three years, was that a prayer of deliverance, or was that a prayer of healing, no. or was that... What, was it, there anything it, it was particular? just a normal humdrum Tuesday night prayer, wasn't it? It was nothing special, nothing breakthrough. And Did you know at the time, though? Did you no, think? No? no. No. So you just went home and it had gone? Yeah, and there you go, and it just happened. And it's almost because I would almost, because I'm such an exact person, um, if I could remember the exact prayer or the exact everything, what everyone was doing, I would probably idolise that and think, right, that's yeah. got to work for part two. But yeah. God always makes new testimonies out of everything. Yeah. And for everyone else, and we know in life, healing is different for absolutely everybody. It's not often always the same as the, you know, the next person. Yeah. Yeah. And I will just say, we are filled with lots of hope that this will go again. Yeah, no, I, I've started really to get my hope back, actually. Hope does not disappoint, Romans 5 says. Absolutely, you know? and um, I was going to be coming on to that <laughs> because I can... No, but I will we'll address mm. it now because... Um, I can quite understand how you could get to a place and get to a point where you think, really, yeah, been there, done that, whatever, is it really going to go? But, it, you know, hope deferred makes the heart sick, the Bible yeah, says. Does, yeah. And, you know, God doesn't want us to give up. You know, God, God wants us to, God wants us to, to hope and God wants, and you know, he wants us to move forward and we, it, it, easier said than done, but not getting to the place where we think, well, this is it now. And yeah. you can understand how easily that could be, particularly in your situation or with anyone suffering out there with anything for a very, very long time who's been repeatedly prayed for. Um, Mark and Vicky, um, this uh, no name on this one. You don't know this, but you've been heroes to me oh. since I started watching Revelation TV. Your honesty has been so helpful over the years because I've suffered depression all my life. Wow. Whenever I hear you, the shame and humiliation leaves me. Brilliant. Thank you for all you do and all you give to the likes of me and many more. Many blessings. Oh, bless. Thank just you so, absolutely awesome. So much. Um, Can I just say, Anne? Just like on Word and Prayer and all the programmes you used to do, we never get through all the emails, but they all get read straight after. So never, oh, think, absolutely. never think that you're typing in vain, I tell no. you. We, we have, I've, honestly, I've spent many a time almost in tears walking out of this studio from having read people's beautiful yeah. words after the show. We, 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 we haven't got enough time, have we? Yeah. Literally, you can't. Definitely not. Um, dear Mark, I know my torment. Although not OCD, I could not think or pray. I thought I was going mad. I was also hallucinating. And I wrote, a God, I wrote God a letter saying if he didn't help me, I'd have to go and see a psychiatrist. In a meeting, someone had a picture of an angel dropping peace into me. I felt that peace and was immediately set free. Oh, wow. I'm praying for you. And that's Christine, Christine. from Yorkshire. And I say that, talking about peace. Because we spoke about yes. this to people. Tell us that, that experience. It was that quite amazing. This was um, over 10 years ago. Our children were very little. And uh, Mark came um, in from work and um, was struggling to get up the stairs to go to bed. And he could be at the bottom of the stairs for two or three hours. And I've always tried to encourage Mark, speak, rationale, and nothing was working. And uh, I sort of was defeated, um, feeling so despondent and despairing myself. Um, I walked up the stairs very heavy headed and just laid on the bed, um, hoping I would just be able to fall asleep and block it all out. All the while, Mark is still downstairs, stuck, cannot get up those stairs. Uh, he was just frozen to the spot. And um, I laid on the bed, and <laughs> um, it's only happened the once, but it was um, an experience of overwhelming peace just came upon me. I literally was just in the presence of God, filled with the Spirit, just laying there, feeling wow. so peaceful, you could feel it. And um, that was that was a one-off, but it just reassured me, the Lord is there, he, he does know, he does understand, and um, we're never alone in this. Do you find it, it's probably gonna sound like a really flippant question, but 
how do you do you have you given up on trying to make sense of this do, when you do you still discuss it together do you still try and you know it's a long time to be suffering from something and trying to look at the rationale behind it well we don't really talk much about the rationale behind it really Anne. um we're such in survival mode mm -hmm. i.e it literally takes all of our uh, calories and spiritual gumption just to f survive each day so we we don't have many deep conversations about the if whys and wherefores we've come to the dis decision really that rev tv is the reason um why we have suffered so intensely over these years quite frankly i no pastor has ever touched me I, I can't do anything but i can speak and i can preach and i can teach they're my things i'm too heavy for vicars okay if you st stick me in front of a normal congregation they'd all probably have heart attacks and jump out the window, you know, within five minutes because I actually believe what's written in the Bible. If it wasn't for Howard and Leslie Gordon Lorna plonking me in a seat many years ago and saying, there's a camera, where you go, we're off. And all of a sudden, 13 years later, you've done hundreds of hours of live TV. If it wasn't for this, I would actually be thinking, what on earth is the point of this? I can see the point. The point is thousands of people out there that sit and listen and interact and get hope and get courage to see the next day. So if it wasn't for Rev TV and me chatting away incessantly on here, I would have been worried. But I know that this is the reason why the Lord has allowed this affliction. He hasn't given it to me, but he has allowed it. Um, yeah. But we're both naturally very positive people. Yes, you Mark's are. Mark's never suffered with depression, um, where normally it would go hand in hand. Um, so any of this, stuff we turn to good mm. we always look for the good in it the the good in our daily walk the good that the lord is doing in us through us the enemy is not gonna get one up on us on this Amen. that i mean definitely like we were saying in the first program mark um you know i couldn't necessarily build a biblical precedent for this but you know there does seem to be evidence that would suggest that the enemy looks out if there's a special anointing or a special calling on people's mm. life you know in, in the natural realm sometimes we we just notice something about someone yeah. um in the spiritual realm i think that must be heightened i don't know how many times and you know the enemy can come against you because of a particular calling on your life but yeah but you, it, god knows all about it and you know, there's just not enough time to, to to say everything and to discuss everything we want to discuss. But all I want to say is, you know, when it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Psalm from, 121. Exactly, from whence my help comes mm. from. And I'll your help comes from the Lord. Mm. But I heard that in connection with God is surrounding you. God is surrounding you. And sometimes we, we look at, you know, where the enemy is at and we feel yeah. surrounded by the enemy. But the message in this particular um, sermon was God is surrounding whatever is surrounding you. That is wonderful. And it, it's just a wonderful illustration. Sometimes we're caught and we just think, don't forget he goes before you and he goes behind you yeah. and, and his hand is on you. Yes. Yeah. But also sometimes you need to look beyond. Yeah. You've got the enemy there, but I, I lift my eyes to the hills I and I look through it. And God is surrounding whatever yeah. is surrounding you. And, and I really do, I really do, you know, Thank share you. your optimism that you do yeah. feel that something's happening right now. It is. This is not an accident that mm. you guys are on this programme. Yeah, mm. I know, I know. Do you know, and it reminds me of uh, Elijah and his servant. Do you remember when uh, he was getting a bit panic struck about all the Assyrians? And Elijah said, what are you worried about? You know, there might be 186,000 them, whatever there was. He says, I'll, I'll pray for you. And he prayed for his servant. He opened his eyes and he saw the angelic hosts far outnumbering the Assyrians. That's exactly the is sermon that, that I'm that talking what? about. God is surrounding whatever is surrounding you. It wasn't a Derek you. Walker special, no, was it? Because we do love no, a bit of Derek Walker. No, it wasn't. But that is so true <laughs> because he basically, which is what is interesting, when his servant opened his eyes and saw the, you know, the army, um, his words were, oh, oh no, oh Lord, <laughs> which is a good prayer. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, it was like, Elisha didn't pray that, you know, God would zap them, come down with yeah. hellfire and brimstone and just annihilate them all. He prayed, which was probably quite worrying for the servant, like yeah. of all the things you could have prayed, you prayed for my eyes to be open. Yeah. I want them gone. Yes, I don't want to see this. <laughs> I don't want to see this. But when he opened his eyes and he said, you know, there are more of us than there are of them. Amen. Amen. 
and that's what we've got to that's what we've got to hang on to I'm going to try and get a few more emails out. hello Anne Mark and Vicky this is from Elaine hi Elaine your story Mark has overwhelmed me and what I'm wondering is as I'm watching you tonight being interviewed by Anne interesting question are you experiencing as you're being interviewed tonight is there anything going on or is she said or is that too personal I've asked no, the question do you know what? I, I actually feel quite good I'm highly registering that my left hand's on top of my right and this and I'm, I'm very conversant and aware and cognitively aware of exactly what is going on yeah. but my anxiety levels are okay and, and I'm functioning well no I'm, I'm quite good in fact it I used almost, to lift completely I, though with it, it on voice I, I almost treat television as almost a rest yeah I've got two rests in my life Sleep, which I sleep phenomenally because I'm exhausted, and TV. Because oh, I'm so emptied out and poured out like a drink offering on TV, um, actually, I can, I'm fairly relaxed on TV because I know God is at work and he's doing his will, Philippians 1.6. He is doing it and he'll finish it. And I can actually fairly relax on live TV. How bonkers is that? So I'm actually quite good clearly, at Clearly, it is clearly the, uh, the Lord. Can I ask you, in, you had three years of respite, we are praying, we are hoping. We've had loads and loads of texts and emails that there's no way we could get through a, you know, a fraction of them, but we will be reading them all, yep. so you're not, you're not writing them in vain, as Mark has said. But imagine that you were to wake up tomorrow and you didn't, and this had gone, and you weren't clocking off the three year mark to see if it was going to come back. You knew that it had gone. What would be some of the best things about being free because certain things mark that maybe the rest of us all take for granted that we don't even think twice about what would be the things that you would really enjoy the most about being free not feeling ill all the time i always feel ill um a continual churning up in my stomach and a continual wondering of whether i've done these heinous things that's the biggest thing and number two the amount of time saved Oh, you know, the Lord says, I'll, I'll, I will restore the years to you that the locusts have eaten. Amen. I stand on that because I'm having a bit of a midlife crisis. I've hit 48. I'm still running around like Forrest Gump doing marathons. But I'm starting to realise, actually, 12 years ago, I was 36. In 12 years time, I'll be 60. And I'm starting to think, oh, I feel like I've wasted so much of my life. None of my life's been wasted at all. But the amount of time that seems lost to this inane, senseless drivel is quite scary. But... In God's economy, none of this time is lost. Absolutely not. Vicky, we're coming to the end of the programme. Um, what would you say to anybody out there who is living with a sufferer of OCD? Um, make sure you're in Christ. That yeah. is Amen. <laughs> what makes all the difference. If we wasn't, I can't imagine what our walk would have been like. I don't know if we'd still be together. Um, but the Lord guides you, shows you the way. He's given us the word to keep us going, to strengthen us. Um, it's, it's been amazing. It, it, it's been a hideous walk and an amazing walk. It's both, you know, it's like two parallel lives that we've lived yeah. and um, hang on in there. The Lord will bring you through, um, whether it's now or in eternity, but there's no reason why now, why it can't be now. Absolutely and that's our not. hope for Mark. Absolutely not. We've had mm -hmm. um, so, so many texts and emails. Thank you so, so much. Um, a final word to you in the remaining um, minute and moment, Mark. Somebody watching who's going through this hell on earth just now who can totally relate out of the many thousands of people that are watching now, what would you say to them in the remaining moments? Okay. Ignore your feelings. They don't get a vote. Okay. You're going to have to live in the word of God incessantly. If you're in it day and night, fine do that i've had to do it that's how i've become conversant with it your feelings don't get a vote try not try to ignore your feelings and literally walk on truth okay so if you're not sure that you've done all these heinous things which is very very typical ocd they are very opposite of the essence of a, of a person stand on the word and do not move away well from we're it. standing with Amen. you we believe a line has been drawn in the sand thank you very very much to the both of you i know you've been a tremendous blessing to all of our viewers god bless you all we'll see you next week for another edition of speaker's corner <laughs>